Our next guest is one of my favorite people and favorite writers in the whole world. I've, I first met Rev. Wortham. Um, I've, I think I've mentioned on the show before that in, in my business, in the book business, 100% of all business is conducted at the bar. And I was at a, a conference called Sleuth Fest. It's conducted down in Florida. It's, it's for mystery writers. And I was, it was a busy time for me. I had a lot of stuff to do. And I kept walking past the bar. It's like, I don't know, it was maybe 11 o'clock in the morning. And there's this guy, there's a cowboy, cowboy hat, boots, the whole nine, the whole nine yards, just sitting in a bar. And I kind of nod and he nods. And then an hour later, I finished with the first thing I had to do. I go walking past and he hasn't moved. He's still in the bar. And after a couple of cycles of doing this, I said, you know, the bar isn't open yet. And he said, yeah, but it soon will be. Um, so, uh, so Revis Wortham is an, an extraordinary writer. Um, he's won the Spur Award from the Western Writers Association twice. I don't know how many Will Rogers medals he's, he's got. Um, his work has been compared justly to Harper Lee, and he, he is a Texan through and through. You will not, when he starts talking, you will not mistake him as a Bostonian. Good morning, Rev. Good morning, John. You know what? I, I don't even want to say anything because after that introduction, anything I'm going to say is just going to be downhill from there. <laughs> this is Rob Revis. You look like you just stepped right out of the cast of Yellowstone, man. Uh, well, you know, I appreciate that. I was actually in 1883 for about a half a second. So, yeah, I've uh, I've always looked like this, because, except for the mustache, uh, ever since I was in high school. People, I did a, a talk uh Yesterday, or a couple of days ago, and I walked into uh, an office visiting a friend, and uh, didn't have my hat on because I took it off when I walked in. And he looked for my hat right off the bat. He said, "I've never seen you with it off before." I said, "Well, uh, on occasion you have to let a little air get to your scalp." So I took it off when I walked in for him. <laughs> so I need to hear the story before we get into your book about 1883 and how you're in there for half a second. Oh man, I tell you what, that was that was quite a uh, quite an experience. My, they filmed the opening segments. If you saw 1883, they filmed it in uh, Fort Worth, uh, Texas, and they they uh, changed the, uh, some of the old sex, the old stockyards. They made it look like it looked back in the 1800s. And my daughter saw that they were they were doing an open call for uh, for extras. And I am I am working on a novel that uh, par partially is set in 1971. Uh, on a Sam Peckinpah set for um, uh, an old Steve McQueen movie. Uh, I don't know if anybody ever saw it, uh, Junior Bonner. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to see what it was like to be on set. So I sent my, my photo in and some information to uh, the, the cast directors, and they, they called me up. They wanted me to play a part. Now, the, the part they wanted me to play was very embarrassing because it wasn't a cowboy. They wanted to be me to be a city dude, and so they put me – in a um, vintage uh, 1800 wool suit and a derby hat, and it was about 100 degrees for a, for a day and a half while we filmed the opening scene. And I understand why people in those old old pictures look crampy and, and <laughs> mad because I was burning up, man. I tell you, it was terrible. But I was there for a, a day and a half. Uh, got to meet uh, Sam Elliott just for a moment. And uh, it, was, it was great, great meeting him because he looked over at me and he said, "Nice mustache." And I said, "Well, yours isn't bad either." And, <laughs> and uh, a couple of the other guys. And so they filmed it, and 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 when it came out, we started looking for me in the opening scene because I'm just a crowd uh, in the crowd. I'm on the street as they as uh, the, the main character right, drives his wagon down the street. And I couldn't see it for a long time. Finally, my niece called me, and she said, I saw you. If you look over the mule's butt, you'll see the top of your <laughs> your face, and that's it. Which is, you know, my, my, my grand appearance in, in film is, is over a mule's rear end. But it was a funny experience anyway. Mule butt's a nickname that can stick. Uh, that'd be a good name for a, <laughs> good name for a band, well, too, I think. Yeah. High noon on a mule's butt. <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoyed your Sam Elliott impression, Revis. That was actually pretty good. <laughs> Well, thank you. I wish I wish I could get my voice that deep, man. He's got a, he has a great voice. John, let's talk about Mr. Revis's book here. Well, he he really um, kind of lit up the the literary verse with his Red River Mysteries series. And Rev, you know what story I want you to tell? But sitting with your granddad and kind of but get into the um, into what the Red River Mysteries are about and where they're set. Okay, yeah. Um, my first novel is called The Rock Hole. Um, and it was a, it was a local swimming hole in, in rural northeast Texas on a, on a little creek, 
And I, I partially grew up in a little town called Shakota, Texas, and uh, spent my summers, my vacations, all my all my free time as a kid up there on my grandparents' farm. But I went to, to school in Dallas. But my granddad was a, a constable. He he was uh, he, he was one of those guys that farmed all day long, and then he would clean up and put a little tiny badge on, and then he was the local constable. If I needed uh, someone picked up or if there was a problem, they had to come find him in the field on his John Deere tractor. But uh, it was it was it was it was idyllic. It was it was a great time to grow up back in the in the sixties, and that that little farm figures predominantly and that region is predominant in all of my Red River books, which are set in the 1960s. But in about 1963 or 64, um, they kept finding mutilated animals in the river bottoms uh, around uh, Shakota, Texas. And, and it, it baffled my granddad. They'd call him and uh, he'd go out and look and find these animals. and They, they couldn't figure out why people were doing this. Uh, but each time there was a, a note to say what the next animal victim was going to be. And I can remember the old man up at the store. I would go up. I don't know if any of you guys grew up in the country or not, but the general store, the, the country stores, were, it was it was our Facebook at the time. That's where you got all your information. Uh, and, and I would go up to the store with my granddad and listen to these old guys talk. <laughs> old, old men, I thought of at the time. Uh, they were younger than I am today. But – they would talk about these animal mutilations and, and who might be doing these things to, to animals and why. And and they went on for quite a while, and then my granddad got a little note. Uh, they found a guy hanging a, 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 a note that was a, just a clip of a, of a uh, newspaper article, and it was about uh, kids playing uh, uh, ball and getting ready for to go back to school in, in the uh, right after Labor Day, which is when we started going to the kids. And that clip told my granddad that there were going to be human victims, is what he thought. But they did find a, a man hanging over a barbed wire fence, just like uh, they would hang coyotes or, or wolves over fences back when I was a kid when they would kill them. And this went on for, for quite some time, and granddad would investigate, and people would talk about it. And then it ended. Never heard another word about it for for, for years and years. And I was grown and married and sitting on the porch with him in his farm one day. And, and his last couple of years, he'd sit out there and watch his cows graze in the pasture. And I was sitting with him, and we were talking and, and um, about the old days and things that we recalled. And then I remembered those mutilations, and I asked him. I said, you know, I, I went through the story, and I said, do you remember all that going on? And he nodded. And I said, well, Granddad, did you all ever catch this guy, or did, or did you ever find anything else about him? And he looked over at me across the porch with these, these ice blue eyes of his. I, they just cut right through you. He looked at me for a long time, and then he looked back out, and he didn't speak to me. He spoke to the pasture. And he said, well, son, sometimes some folks just need killing. And that's all he said. Was it the guy? It took, oh, I'm sorry. Was, was it the no, guy that they hung over the fence? No, it was not. No, he was, he was uh, uh, allegedly a victim. So... I wondered what happened after that. You know, these, these are old men that, that uh, survived the Depression. They survived World War II, Korea. And I often wondered if someone had taken um, the law into their own hands and maybe put him down in a, in a hole in the, in the river bottom down in northeast Texas and, and covered him up. I don't know. And all of that is childhood supposition and, and, and memories, and I cannot find anyone – they can give me any details about that, but that became the framework for my first novel, The Rock Hole, and uh, that led me to a, an entire series through Poison Pen Press to write about that era and the people of that of that area and the way life truly was back uh, in the 1960s uh, during the, the dark days of the Vietnam War and, and, and civil rights changes and the, the, the cusp from being rural to uh, an urban area here in Texas. What I love about your books, Red, among a, a, a lot of things, there are some writers who 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 make the the location a character. You know, the, the there's such a, a love for the environment that you write about, and it just it comes right through the page. In fact, for folks who are listening, if um, 
when, when you should buy his books, when you do, now that you've heard him, you're going to hear him reading to you as, as you read the books. It's, it's kind of a, an interesting thing. So now talk, we're going to shift. We've got a real problem here in West Virginia and Berkeley County that dealing with drugs, opiates and such. And, um, your latest book, um, hard country kind of delves into that world with a brand new character for you, Tucker Snow. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, John, that came about, uh, Tucker Snow came about because of, and again, again, it is, uh, it's it's a rural based book. It takes place in, in, in Northeast Texas. And it came about when we had a family ranch up in Oklahoma, um, it was just across the river near a little town called Durant, and everybody would, people people that move in down here call it Durant, but uh, those that know call it Durant because we put a little Texas accent on everything. And uh, it was it was a pretty good size it was a pretty good size ranch, fifteen hundred acres, and uh, it was it was idyllic too. John has been to the ranch house up there. It was, it was a glorious place to sit out uh, and, and look over the pasture and, and, and raise cows. The only problem was. Uh, 300 yards from the house across the dirt road or gravel road was a mess by house. And there were people driving back and forth all the time to go buy, uh, to, go, to go get drugs. I don't know anybody specifically that did. However, we had a, um, uh, and they never busted anyone there as far as I know uh, while we were there, while I was up at the ranch. But um, we had a, a Secret Service agent spend the night up there one night. And that was the first thing he said the next morning. Because you guys realize it was a buy house over here. And people were running the road all night long to come over. And he said, we did. And not long after that, uh, some of the people there at the buy house uh, needed a little cash, I guess. So they came in. While we were gone, they kicked the doors in the ranch house and stole bizarre things. Pots, pans. They didn't take the TV. They took, they took coffee filters and, and, and rags. And, and everything out from underneath the, the kitchen counter. And uh, I, I spoke to uh, some, some friends that I had met, uh, some uh, DPS, undercover narcotics agents, and they said, yeah, they were using all that to cook this mess. And they also stole our truck, which is what got them caught, because they, they, they stole a, a, a Dodge Dually and tried to drive it through the pipe fence that was locked. Well, even even a thirty five hundred dually is not going to get through a pipe fence. I can promise you that. And they tried it several times. Then they backed up and, and drove through a barbed wire fence. It's what we call barbed wire down here in Texas. And they drove through a five strand barbed wire fence. And they drove straight over to the Beth house to uh, get a couple of hits before they disappeared off into the in the in the hinterlands. But uh, we called the cops, or my brother in law called the local sheriff's department. They drug their feet on the investigation, and we eventually found out that's because there was some uh, familial uh, relations going on in there, and they weren't going to bust their own kinfolk. Uh, and the only way that we were able to um, to get the truck back and get a resolution to what was going on over there was because a, a highway patrol officer in Oklahoma pulled over the truck that had been reported stolen and got the bad guy, and they started tracing it back. But all, all that... Well, all that information, I wanted to do something with it. I was going to write something anyway, but I met a couple of brothers not long afterwards that used to be undercover narcotics agents for the uh, DPS, uh, Rick and Dan Easterwood. And they become very close friends, and, and John and I have spent uh, a few nights sitting around fires or sitting outside uh, exchanging stories and drinking brown water with those guys <laughs> and, and hearing their stories. And the stories, the later it gets and the lower the level of the bottle uh, – Yes, the, the more hair raises on the back of your neck from the things you guys told us that they've been involved in that had to, to do. And those events and those guys' personalities became Harley and Tucker Snow in this new series that I just started um, through Source Books and Poison Pen Press. And, and the funny thing is, uh, I did the launch signing two nights ago here in the Dallas area, and the boys showed up, um, uh, Rick and Dan. They're sitting out in the audience. We're talking, and, and after I signed, after it was over with, I'm signing books. Dan's uh, daughter came up and she said, "You nailed Dad to a T. He's he's the kind of guy that will shoot you, uh, and, and then go have breakfast and not really care about whether he's in it or not." <laughs> so, I, so characters, the characters uh, are loosely based on those boys and, and based on some experiences that I've had through through the through the years. And actually, it debuted uh, as the ten best picks for Amazon for the month of August. So we're getting some uh, some traction on this one, and we're all excited about it. Revis Z. Wortham, our guest here on the program. He is 
uh, an author in the John Gilstrap circle. Uh, by the way, John set this interview uh, up for us. Revis, uh, any movie plans, screenplay plans in the future? You know what? I, 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 there's always hope. And, and there, <laughs> for this one, not yet. But my first novel, Rockhole, when it came out, I got a phone call. Just out of the blue, I was back when we had, still had landlines, and my, my phone rang, I answered it, and it was the people that had just finished filming Winter's Bone. I don't know if you read the, movie, the book or saw the movie. Yes. And they said, Rev, this, is, this will be our next project. Uh, the Rock Hole's just right up our alley. We're going to film that. I said, great. I just got myself a new agent. Uh, here's her phone number. Call her, and let's do this. And I, I turned it over to her. Didn't hear anything for weeks. I called her back up, and... I said, what's going on with this movie deal? And she said, well, they didn't offer us enough money up front, so I'm going to hold out for more. And I said, no, we're not. No, no. And I called these guys up. I said, whatever you want to do to get this on the screen, we'll do it. Well, she had already made them mad, and uh, they pulled the plug on that, and I fired her. Uh, I should have fired her based on John's suggestion that the moment he met her, but I didn't know any better. I had to learn. But I fired her, got a new wonderful agent. But nothing has come up yet. No one's approached me for Hard Country, but I think it would be a, I think it'd be a, make a great film. The evening of that first meeting in the bar down in Florida when I first saw him, his publishing universe was around him. His editor was there and, and his agent was there. And after about 15 minutes of talking to his agent, when we had a moment alone, I said, you need to fire her. <laughs> 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 I, listen, I got to tell you, I'm a little disappointed that you fired her. I was expecting that she went, she disappeared. She went missing. <laughs> <laughs> down the rock hole. Well, that yeah. would down the rock hole. That would have, that would have involved driving all the way out to St. Simon's Island, Georgia, to drag the body back here. And I just didn't have the, well, I didn't have the spirit to do it. You know, some agents just need killing. <laughs> oh, now there's a lot of truth in that. <laughs> <laughs> and that from a prosecuting attorney, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Winter's Bone, by the way, if I recall, is one of Jennifer Lawrence's first movies. I'm not sure where it stacks in her chronology of, of films, but I know it's early on. And it's uh, I just kind of stumbled upon it a few years ago one day, clicking around, and that's a pretty good movie. So you were, in, you were at least in the right direction there with the people. I, I was. I was I was excited. It was just inexperience on my part and, and absolute inexperience on my former agent's part. But, uh, you know, hope all these movies turn uh, one of these days, someone may call us up and, and we get something out. Yeah, I have, I have a couple of others, and, and I, I, I had feelings out with folks in Hollywood. And someone will mention, and yeah, maybe we're looking at it, and then it'll just fizzle away. But I, you know, they tell me if they're if people in Hollywood, if their mouths are moving, they're lying to you. So I'm not yep. sure if it's, if it's ever going to happen or not. So I, while I have you and John together, the same uh, segment here, uh, your take on the writer's strike and the actor's strike going on in Hollywood, which uh, and, and if this doesn't stop fairly soon, they're going to start to run out of new content to put on uh, to entertain people. Yeah, uh, I, I haven't delved into it a whole lot, but I do recall the first time we had a writer's strike like this is where we got this horrible world of reality TV because they had no scripts, no shooting. And they filled all the time with, with the, the TV that I can't stand to watch, and so I'm afraid the evolution is going to take us to something even worse if that's possible, like – you know, modern country music on it on uh, reality TV. Wait, they already have that, don't they? So mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's hell on earth. So where do I, I know you're a country music snob. Um, you, you go way back, you know, if it doesn't have wailing steel guitars, you're not interested. So where do you come down on this Jason Aldean thing? Well, you, you know what? I come down on, on this one. I I'm, don't listen to Jason Aldean. I've heard the song. I am 100% behind that boy. He, he wrote a song about this wonderful country of ours, the way it should be, the way people will stand up and do what's right. And uh, the, the cancel culture is all over him. And so I, I support him 100%. The best thing that can happen to you is if the cancel culture goes after you because then you sell more songs. <laughs> he was number one on the charts, yeah, wasn't he? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, you know what? Just recently, the three top songs in pop country uh, are country. Now, get, you know, I'm mean, pop music. So the, the, on the pop charts right now, the top three songs were just recently country songs, what, what they call country anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, I'm, I'm pleased to see that anyway. Some things are changing for the better, maybe. I don't know. 
And I, I just, uh, at almost 70 years old, you, you, you kind of just want to sit back and watch and see what's happening and only get involved when it really gets nasty. Uh, Revis, uh, again, plug your book and tell everybody where they can get it. Okay, thank you so much. It's called Hard Country, and it is available in all formats on, on all platforms. All you have to do is just type in uh, Hard Country. And there's another novel out there from many years ago called Hard Country, but mine, uh, if you just talk Type in Revis, R-E-A-V is in Victory I-S, Revis Z Wortham, and uh, you can find me on a, on the Internet. You can go to my website at uh, RevisZWortham.com or Facebook or anywhere else. Just go out there and give me a holler. I'd love to speak to you and love to have you as a fan. Can I get your Sam Elliott nice mustache impression again? <laughs> well, I don't know. I'll try the best I can. <laughs> That's not a that's not a little Elvisy. <laughs> oh, 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 baby, if you want Elvis, I can give you an Elvis. Be careful, you'll be part of the open. <laughs> I think it's too late. Revis, thank you so much. Have a great day, man. It is, it's been a pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you for having me on. And, and John, always good to talk to you, my brother. Talk to you soon.